Hello and welcome to Just Have Another Think, our monthly look at the ecological, environmental and social consequences of our 21st century climate emergency. I talk quite a lot on this channel about big industrial polluters and how they're impacting the atmosphere by emitting huge quantities of greenhouse gases. It's enough to make you think it's all a bit hopeless. In fact, I often receive comments like, why should I change my lifestyle to save a few kilograms of CO2 when China is opening the equivalent of a new coal mine every week? What's the point? And of course, that state of mind is manna from heaven for our good friends in the propaganda and PR departments of industries like fossil fuel, big pharma and agribusiness. Persuading you and me to change precisely nothing at all is very much a core goal of their communication efforts. But actually, there's quite a lot you can do. So let's have a look at what your individual efforts can achieve if you're a fairly average consumer living in the USA or Europe. And if you're not from those parts of the world, then there's a good chance that you can use the numbers in this video as a pretty good approximation for your own country. Top of the pile is transport. This study, published in August 2020 by the Centre for Research into Energy Demand Solutions, found that the most impactful action an individual in a rich Western nation can take to reduce their carbon footprint is to ditch the car completely. Doing that here in Europe would save just over two tonnes of CO2 equivalent per person per year. That's a pretty big slug off your overall total. If you absolutely need a car, then buying an electric vehicle could save just under two tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year over its lifetime. And that'll vary, of course, depending on how your electricity grid is powered. In the UK and many parts of Europe, it's possible to recharge your EV battery using 100% renewable power. But other countries and states may still depend heavily on fossil fuels. Even in those parts of the world, though, the efficiency of EVs translates into a tangible reduction in overall emissions. And if you're able to put solar panels on your home, then you can charge up your car with free energy direct from the sun with no emissions at all at the point of use. Whatever kind of vehicle you drive, though, you can still drastically minimise the number of journeys you use it for. Don't take the car a mile down the road to do a bit of shopping, for example. Walk there or go by bicycle. You'll be much fitter as a result. And the chances are you'll buy fewer items as well, focusing only on the essentials. If you're going further afield, then consider the bus or train. Using public transport for commuting and longer distance travel saves an average European almost a tonne of CO2 a year. Then there's flying. Avoiding a single long haul flight per year saves between one and three tonnes of CO2 equivalent per person. Avoiding flights is one of the most effective things you can do to reduce your emissions total. As an example, taking the Eurostar from London to Paris emits about six grams of CO2 for every kilometre travelled. Making that journey by plane produces 133 grams of CO2 plus 121 grams of other emissions. If you're planning your next vacation, why not take the opportunity to discover some of the beauty spots in your own country instead of jetting off abroad? And if you're in a job that involves attending a lot of long distance business meetings, then the lockdowns of 2020 showed us that many of them can be just as effective over Zoom or Teams. Next up is home energy. A full energy efficiency retrofit on an average European home would save nearly a tonne of CO2 equivalent per person per year. That's a massive saving on CO2, but it's obviously a significant financial outlay too. So if you can't afford that kind of upfront cost, then there are still some really useful things you can do. Insulating your home's loft space and cavity walls is perhaps the most important step. It'll help keep your home warm during the winter and cool in the summer. And you'll use far less energy as a result, which reduces your CO2 emissions and your household bills. Turning down the heating thermostat by a couple of degrees during the day and right down during the night can make a big difference to your energy costs. Same goes for AC if you've got it. Using those devices in a smart way could save as much as 10% on your annual energy bill. Check whether there's a 100% renewable energy provider in your country or state. I know that can be a bit tricky in certain US states where power companies still enjoy a legally enforced and completely unfair monopoly. But things are changing fast, even in America. Energy providers in many parts of the world are now offering greener tariffs. We've got several here in the UK. By switching to a company that provides electricity from renewables, you'll almost certainly find that you save money. And of course, you'll be drastically reducing your carbon dioxide emissions as a result. 
Whenever you're looking for a new appliance, keep energy efficiency top of mind. The first question should be, do I really need this appliance at all? But you know, if it's a fridge or a washing machine or something like that, then the answer may well be yes. In which case, make sure you check its energy efficiency rating before you buy it. The simplest home energy improvement you can make if you haven't already done so, is to replace all your incandescent light bulbs with LEDs. Old fashioned light bulbs are breathtakingly bad at using energy to produce light. 90% of the electricity that flows into them just produces heat. LED lamps instantly eliminate more than 75% of this unnecessary energy waste. And they last 25 times longer too. So while they may be a bit more expensive to buy, you'll actually save money in the long run. According to the US Department of Energy, by 2027, the widespread use of LED lighting in the United States could save $30 billion in energy costs and reduce the use of electricity by the equivalent of 44 large power plants. And then there's all those electronic devices we use these days. Leaving them on standby uses energy and costs you money. Even your phone charger continues to draw power if it's left plugged in and switched on after you've used it. The energy industry calls it vampire power or phantom power. According to the Office of Sustainability at Harvard University, the total electricity consumed by idle electronics in America equates to the total annual output of 12 power plants. Games consoles are the worst culprit, using power to constantly look for software updates even when they're asleep. Leaving stuff on standby can cost an average UK household about £35 per year, and of course it increases those carbon emissions too. That might not sound like a huge chunk of change, but multiply that by 240 million homes here in Europe, another 240 million in North America, 650 million in China, and all the households of other developed nations around the world, and it starts to add up to a pretty scary number. So every time you finish using a device, including your computer and TV, don't leave them on standby, switch them off at the plug socket. Electric tumble dryers are one of the largest energy consumers in a home, emitting over a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent from an average US household. So if you have outdoor space, then put a line or rotary dryer up whenever the weather allows it. And if you're in an apartment, then invest in a good quality drying rack to dry your clothes indoors. If you're lucky enough to own your own home and you can afford the initial outlay, then rooftop solar panels are a great way to reduce your domestic carbon emissions. You may even choose to couple them with battery storage so that you can make use of the solar energy your panels collect during the daytime to run your home during the evening. Costs are tumbling, and if you go online, you'll find no shortage of information and advice on how to get started in your part of the world. The same goes for air source and ground source heat pumps. Again, it depends on how much outside space you have, but these installations can remove the need for a fossil fuel boiler in your home. Instead, they use the energy in the air and the ground to run heat exchanges that provide all your hot water. Next on our list is work and study. If you've got kids at school, then why not get involved with the school administrators and PTAs to find out how they propose to reduce their CO2 emissions through initiatives like architectural design, waste management, intelligent food options, and energy conservation. Ask your kids if they're involved in any green programs at school, things like growing vegetables, composting food waste, and dealing with waste paper. Those sorts of things can be fun for kids, and of course, they're learning about climate and environmental issues while they're doing it. In your own workplace, ask your employer if they've set up an environmental committee to assess the CO2 emissions from the company's everyday operations. It'll probably be quite surprising how much low-hanging fruit there is to go at. Reducing paper and ink waste is a good start. This can be achieved by double-sided printing and printing in black and white instead of color, and not allowing everyone in a meeting to print off exactly the same 50-page report before they arrive. You can aim to minimize single-use plastic by providing glasses and tap water in meetings instead of bottled water. And there are now green renewable energy tariffs available for businesses in many countries too. Switching the office, factory or store over to one of those providers could result in a nice saving on the bottom line. How about designating someone to turn off electronics, lights and heat in the evening and encouraging the proliferation of green plants to improve air quality? And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's remote working. The lockdowns have shown us that many people can work just as well from home 
as they can from the office. Working out a proper rotor system for this activity will keep travel emissions to a minimum. And if your company really is fully engaged in the drive towards reducing their carbon emissions, then you might be able to convince them to change their corporate banking facility to a green ethical bank like Triodos and move their pension provider to one that doesn't invest in fossil fuels at all. And by the way, that goes for your own personal bank accounts and pensions too. More than $14.5 trillion has been divested out of fossil fuels in the last 10 years or so, much of which has been taken away by big banks and pension funds. And if you've personally really got the climate and environment bit between your teeth, then have a look to see if you can join a volunteer program with an environmental group, many of whom have land conservancies and other environmental stewardship programs going on around the world. It's a great way to meet other like-minded folks, keep up with the latest issues, and do some tangible good in your own community. Another biggie on our carbon reduction list is food. Our global food systems account for about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. So what you and your family consume can make a big difference here. According to the CRED study we looked at earlier, an average European resident moving to a fully plant-based diet would save 800 kilograms of CO2 per year. That's about the same CO2 reduction as they get from completely retrofitting the home with eco-friendly solutions. But you don't necessarily have to go the full vegan. In the States, according to the Center for Sustainable Systems at Michigan University, eating chicken instead of beef for one year would reduce the carbon dioxide emissions of an average American by 400 kilograms. Even if you just have one vegetarian meal a week, you could still reduce your emissions by an amount equal to driving a car nearly 1,200 miles over the course of a year. If you've got the space, then why not have a go at growing your own fruit and vegetables? It's pretty labor intensive, but it's great fun for kids and it'll save you a lot of money too. When you do buy food from the store though, make sure it's locally grown so that you avoid all those transport costs and emissions. The Michigan study found that eating all locally grown food for one year could reduce each person's greenhouse gas emissions by an amount equivalent to driving a car a thousand miles. Arguably the biggest food problem we have in our modern world is waste. In the rich industrialized nations, we throw away 30% of all the food we buy. That's just mindless destruction of a precious resource. It adds needless greenhouse gas emissions to our atmosphere, dumps hundreds of millions of tons of usable food into landfills or incinerators, and worsens the divide between the haves and the have-nots. And it's costing a typical American family of four as much as $3,000 a year. So plan ahead when you're doing a food shop. Don't wander aimlessly around a supermarket picking up things you like the look of. Plan the meals you're gonna make for a week or even a month. Write a list of the ingredients that you need for those meals and stick to that list when you're shopping. It's even a good idea to set yourself a budget for each shop and then keep a tally of what you've spent as you're walking around. If you do have leftovers, don't throw them away. Find a way to add them in with other ingredients to make a new meal for another day. You might just surprise yourself with how creative you can be when you put your mind to it. Water is of course the other precious resource that many of us take for granted in rich Western nations. An average European person uses about 250 liters a day. And in the States, that number is 575 liters. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, the average US family wastes 180 gallons of water per week just from household leaks. That's enough water to do 300 loads of laundry a year. So find the leaks and fix them. Apart from anything else, if you're on a water meter, as most people in Europe are nowadays, then it'll save you money on your water bill. And when it comes to your own day-to-day -day water use, just a small amount of planning and discipline can really cut down on waste water. If you've got a dishwasher, make sure you wait until it's completely full before you run it. A full dishwasher is actually more water efficient than washing your dishes in the sink. If you do have to hand wash something, then don't leave the tap or faucet running while you're doing it. And the same goes for cleaning your teeth. Keep the tap off and only use what you absolutely need to rinse your mouth and toothbrush at the end. It's a good habit that you can easily get into. After a few repeats, it just becomes second nature. Take shorter showers too, and stick a house brick or a water saver pouch into the cistern of your toilet. That simple act can reduce the water used in each flush by more than 20%. And while we're on the delicate subject of toilet habits, 
Frankly, there's no need to flush every time you pee either. Just flush fluids once or twice a day or each time you've you know, done the other one. And we all really, really need to stop buying bottled water. The EPA found that Americans consume nearly 64 billion liters of the stuff in 2017. And we weren't far behind here in Europe either at about 57 billion liters. Even though European and American tap water is generally perfectly safe and meets all the health requirements of the EPA and EU, grabbing a bottle while you're on the go is just a bit too convenient, isn't it? It's another case of getting organized and planning ahead. Buy yourself a reusable water bottle or foldable pouch and fill it up from the tap before you go. It's as easy as that, no excuses. According to researchers from the Pacific Institute of Oakland, California, the energy used to produce, transport and chill bottled water is 2000 times more than the energy required to produce tap water. And plastic bottles can take hundreds of years to decompose too. So using less water saves energy and infrastructure costs and also means less water is lost to contamination. And while we're on the subject of plastics, let's talk about plastics and specifically single use plastics. You've probably already had it drilled into your psyche just how harmful single use plastics are. So I won't labor the point here. Suffice to say, never use single use plastic bags for shopping, avoid buying food in flimsy plastic bags or containers and try to buy fresh loose produce wherever possible. Your local store may even let you bring your own containers to put food directly into. Look for alternatives to shrink wrap for keeping your food fresh at home and buy drinks and other consumables in glass containers instead of plastic. That's just a few simple examples and there's loads of other ways to remove plastic from your life if you really want to pursue that mission. And good for you if you do, by the way. So I'll leave some links in the description box below to sites that can advise you on how to get started. Next up is clothing. Our modern throwaway culture is perfectly suited to fast fashion and it can be tempting to buy new clothes all the time. After all, they're so cheap now that we get them all made in sweatshops out in Asia, aren't they? But making all those garments takes materials, energy and other precious resources, not least of which is, yet again, water. So have a think about buying clothes from a charity or thrift store or get into the rapidly expanding online secondhand clothing market. Many of those sites let you sell as well as buy. So you can make good use of the clothes you no longer want as well as saving money on new items. You just need to take care that you're not doing a good thing by buying a secondhand clothing item only to have it shipped from the other side of the world. Try to minimize the distance between you and the seller. And whatever you do, don't throw old clothes away. If you do, they'll just end up as yet more landfill. Donate them to charity shops, or if you're handy with a needle and thread, maybe rework them into something completely new. And if they're really, really old and beyond redemption, then you can always cut them up and use them as cleaning cloths around the house. If you have to shop for a brand new garment, then do some research on the retailer beforehand. Find out what they're doing to reduce their environmental impact and offset their carbon dioxide emissions. And only buy from companies that are taking genuine steps to improve. Whether it's food or clothes or bulkier items like furnishings, recreational equipment, electronics or even vehicles, shopping in general has become a bit of a religion in Western society. We all buy far more things than we really need and that excessive personal consumption of goods all adds to energy use, environmental pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, not just in the extraction of natural resources and in the manufacturing process, but in the transportation and disposal of packaging and all sorts of other activities. So avoid making impulse purchases. Ask yourself whether the item you're looking at is something you really need or something you just want at that moment in time. And if you know you're just buying on a whim, then walk away. And when it comes to the point when you no longer use an existing item in your home, then get your recycling head on. We all know that recycling conserves natural resources, reduces pollution and saves energy. Materials like glass, paper, metal and plastic can all be recycled for use in new products. Before you toss anything away, consider repurposing it in some way if it still has life left in it. Upcycling is a growing movement nowadays. The internet is full of sites with ideas for reusing waste materials from high concept artistic statements to simple DIY projects like turning plastic bottles into planters. It's a bit of a niche. But that make do and mend and reuse and reinvent attitude is just a generally good mindset to get into. 
and all those old mobile phones and other electronic devices that you've got hiding in the bottom of drawers and cupboards all over the house, they can be repurposed too. According to this recent report, 2019 set a record for the largest amount of e-waste ever generated worldwide, almost 54 million metric tonnes of discarded phones, computers, appliances and other gadgets. That's more than the combined weight of all the adults in Europe. It's also a 21% increase since 2014. So if your TV, computer, mobile phone or electronic device still works, give it to someone who can use it. There are plenty of charities and non-profits that specialise in the redistribution of computers to less well-off families, and there are companies that refurbish electronics for resale. And even if your device doesn't work anymore, you may still be able to take it to specialist recyclers who are interested in the valuable metals they contain. If you're keen to quantify how much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases your actions are avoiding, then you can use an online calculator like this one from the World Wildlife Fund. It asks a set of fairly straightforward questions and then tells you the current size of your carbon footprint compared to the average. It's dead easy to do and it's great for identifying the areas where you can make the most difference. Or if you want to have a bit of fun and perhaps get your kids involved, then this new app called the Climate Game is a great option. You get a similar questionnaire to start with, but you also get your very own virtual island to look after from day to day. The app will ask you a few questions each evening about your activities during that day and your answers will determine the health and prosperity of your island. A bit like a Tamagotchi for climate change. It's completely free and you can download it on all platforms. Lastly, but by no means least, you can get involved in some sort of activism to get the message of climate change to more and more people and put pressure on companies and politicians to get their act together and start making the kind of rapid and radical changes that the world so desperately needs. The number of environmental and climate activist groups now operating globally is mind-blowing and far too numerous to try and list here, but a simple search online will get you to a group in your part of the world. It's a sobering thought that just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. But that doesn't mean that our own actions and choices are irrelevant. So don't let the naysayers dissuade you from making positive changes in your own lifestyle. Get together with other like-minded folks and share your successes. Consumer action really does make a difference. And if enough of us do it, then real change will happen. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.